My name is Ken Fudernick. I'm a member of the, uh, of, the, of the team that has been supporting this effort over the last couple of years and planning this event in the, uh, the whole California Labor Management Institute. I, <clears throat> I have to tell you, when I arrived at the hotel, uh, I wanted to know right away where the, this room was. And I said, you know where the opening session is? And someone said, it's in the Crystal Ballroom. And, uh, and I thought, uh, that's an odd name for a, a room uh, to have the opening session, and I assumed it would come down here and there would be a crystal ball on the table, uh, but it is actually the crystal ballroom. Uh, but I, 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 if there was a crystal ball, I think it, was, uh, it would read something like this, that the future uh, for students in California bodes well because uh, leaders and educators in this state have decided not to engage in the education wars. Uh, that's what Charles Kirchner, a, a wonderfully thoughtful writer over here, wrote in Ed Week about this event, and I think it's true. Uh, very little has been accomplished um, through, uh, through vicious fights and wars. And uh, this is really a very special moment, uh, not just for California, but for the nation. This, the largest uh, state in the nation, is one of very few places uh, as a state that has uh, decided uh, to engage in this kind of collaborative work. Another one we'll be hearing from tomorrow a bit is Massachusetts, and we have some colleagues that have come out to uh, observe what we're doing and learn from what we're doing, but also to share what they've been doing for the past few years. They have something that they formed called the Massachusetts Education Partnership. So we are collaborating with another state, but really leading the way in uh, and doing something that very few states elsewhere in the country are doing. Um, so uh, you've heard some inspiring words from uh, state leaders, and, and now we're going to shift and hear from people doing work on the ground. And I, uh, this is a really exciting uh, part, a shift, because uh, virtually all of you, except for the state leaders, are people who work every day on the ground um, uh, educating students. And, we have a great pleasure to have two groups uh, who will be presenting here, sharing their story of collaboration that uh, really has been leading the way, not just in California, but across the nation. Uh, the first is ABC Unified. You've heard about them. You saw Ray a little before. And, um, uh, and the second will be San Juan Unified. And San Juan is sitting over there, I'm told. I, I don't. They're over there. OK, they'll be up. In, uh, in about um, a half hour, and, and we will take questions. So if you're listening to these presentations and have questions, uh, be thinking about them, write them down, and we'll take questions near the end of ABC's presentation. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Sue, but let me just quickly introduce the panel. Mary Sue is the superintendent of uh, ABC Unified. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Rebecca Michelle Macias is here. She's head of the district's uh, CSEA group. <clears throat> Maynard Law, to her right, is the president of the school board, ABC Unified. And Ray Gare is the uh, president of the ABC Federation of Teachers. So, Mary, I'm going to uh, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, it's with absolute delight for our ABC team to be able to be a part of this uh, unique symposium. I do, again, also want to thank uh, Superintendent Torlakson for giving us a little bit of a shout out earlier in terms of the work that we've been doing. Probably the one thing that marks us um, perhaps differently than many of the uh, 49 other district teams that are around the room today is uh, we're probably very old. Uh, we've been at this for 15 years, and that's our story that we want to share with you today. It's the story of our labor management collaboration that has been a partnership that's become such a uh, district-wide uh, system that we have and we want to share our story, and it was only appropriate for us to be able to share it from the different perspectives, from a superintendent, the teachers union, the classified union leaders, as well as our school board president. So each of us will take 
uh, a few minutes to talk about various parts of it. But for those of you who might think, uh, is ABC one of those, uh, you fill out the form and just put X, Y, Z? I always get that because people are always wondering, what is ABC? How, how cute is that, you know, <laughs> taking the alphabet? Well, actually, we're three small districts that unified uh, 50 years ago, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and it's Artesia, Bloomfield, and Carmenita. Then 1965, a committee member, uh, Gretchen Whitney, the first woman board member for ABC, decided to take the first letter of each of those three small districts and made it ABC. So today, we actually serve, we're, by the way, for those of you who are not in the Los Angeles County area or down south here, uh, we're in the southeast corner of Los Angeles County. And we actually serve five cities. Uh, they include Artesia, Cerritos, Hawaiian Gardens, portions of Lakewood and Norwalk. And also, very small portions, a sliver of Long Beach as well as uh, Cyprus. And so today, again, our district, when we I'm sure that all of your districts look very different um, because I know that uh, geographically we represent uh, many other parts of the state who are in the room today. But in ABC, our breakdown ethnically in terms of our student population, we are, I'm sorry, let me go back just for the student demographics first. Uh, in terms of our student demographic, I always like to say that we serve 32,000 students, and that's pre-K through adult school with 21,000 that are K-12 students. We have 30 schools, 19 elementary schools, five middle schools, five high schools, and a very robust adult school. We have also about 51% of our students who are uh, eligible and who participate uh, in the free and reduced lunch program, 20% English learners. Our district's dropout rate is about 2.3% in the, la in the la last uh, data from the state. And we have about 3,400 employees in the district. And again, just this is an important slide for us because we know that the demographics in our school districts are changing. 92% uh, of our student population are of various ethnic groups. About 42% Hispanic Latinos, about 40% uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, 10% uh, African Americans. We only have an 8% white Caucasian population. And that for us has been very exciting to look at all of the five cities that we work with with one of the most diverse student populations probably in the country. So when we talk about the what and the why of our labor management collaboration, these are the four major areas that we're talking about. And I'm so glad that we are following the great panel that preceded us because they really essentially highlighted these very same things, relationships, communications, time, because it does take an extraordinary amount of commitment and time and finally, I think it was Wes who said, you've got to have a common vision. What is it that you're all focusing on together? And so we're going to share a little bit of that in just a minute. OK, so uh, what are the labor management beliefs and structures that help facilitate district-wide initiatives? So you're going to uh, see those in the next few slides here. So. ABC's partnership was uh, born out of a strike, an eight-day strike that happened. You know, but the seeds of collaboration were there in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, but as disconnects started to happen, there was you know financial times, and it's harder to get along when the money's really tight sometimes. Uh, it's hard to get along when the money's there, too. But um, there was a disconnect, and it ended up in an eight-day strike. And for six years, there was a... Um, Various superintendents came in, stopped in, put their programs together, walked off. Uh, things happened. And so there was a lot of disconnect between what was all the different groups and it uh, wasn't good for kids. And so the one thing that we could really uh, agree to six years down was that we needed to do something different. And so uh, a team of school board members, uh, union leaders went back east uh, to look at labor management, which was completely unsexy back then. 
Okay, so, um, so uh, they came back and they decided, you know, we're going to do things a little bit different. And um, it started with the union president and the principal, or the principal, the superintendent, meeting on a regular basis. Now, Mary and I don't talk to each other every day. Uh, we do run into each other at Target once in a while, but we, <laughs> but we meet once a week, uh, 1 o'clock on Wednesday. And you know, we count on those meetings. So that was one of the things, just to meet regularly and have conversations. So then now you have the executive ca the, the cabinet for the union and the administration getting together and talking about, OK, what are some things that we can agree to? If you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Our mission statement there says, you know, that we're going to focus on student achievement. It was the common ground. And so on the previous slide, it said the Southside Reading Collaborative. What that was is what, since we agreed that student achievement was so important, we had a group of six schools in the South Side that really had low single digit, you know, numbers for reading for students that were struggling and schools that were struggling. And if you drove around those schools, you could see there were bullet holes in them and they, they needed more maintenance. And so the district and the union got together and decided we're going to put money towards these six schools. And what that really did is it created a group of six schools that were building capacity. We're building leadership capacity that has blossomed into the people that are in the district office now. So we started with a project. So that's how you start collaboration. You, build, you start with projects, you build relationships, you build trust. Um, institutional partnering is an is underliner there. You're going to see some structures. There are more structures that we built into what you're going to see, but um, you have to memorialize it in a sense because changes in leadership happen. Mary Sue is the third superintendent in this partnership, and I'm the second president. And we have one of the things we want to do is make sure there are structures that will outlast us, and so keep this partnership going because it's been good for students. Um, and it's been good for teachers and, and the district office. And school board members can attest to, you know, ringing lots of golden bells. So it's been good for the school board. Okay, at the bottom there, common understanding of the issues. We do that by sharing information. I talked about an exchange earlier. It's always an exchange of information. As an organization, all of us work exchanging information so we can react to all the changes that are happening quicker. Not, maybe not better all the time, you know, but we're reacting quicker and we're making lots of decisions um, that we can implement faster. So 15 years ago, we actually sat down and created what are called guiding principles. And this is the guiding principles for the Labor Management Partnership. There are principles as well as behaviors, guiding principles for behavior of how we were going to be working together and conducting ourselves when we do work together. Uh, we're not going to go and read all of these because I know you're all proficient readers, but we do want you to have access to them, and they are available on the website or when you access this particular uh, handout. The, the, the ones that are starred, I think, for us, in terms of that are really important is that when Ray mentioned earlier about the first project that we worked on with the South Side Schools and how we looked at developing a project that we knew was most important for both of us and that was re raising the reading achievement of our students in the lower performing schools. Today I'm so proud of all of those schools because we now have the Feeder High School, which is a California distinguished school and soon to get the Gold Ribbon Award. We have a middle school feeder school that we worked with that's now been uh, named a national model middle school. And of course, the four elementary schools that we worked with have all exceeded the API expectations that we've had. So a lot of work was done over those years but those schools have been transformed over the years as well. Um, well, the partnerships guiding principles, um, they are actually um, a commitment to hiring the top 5% of teachers in the profession um, to teach our students, which would uh, to get, we will work together to hire, train, and retain these professionals. 
Most importantly, you're going to see that all employees contribute to student success, meaning everybody makes it work. Teachers get the cheeks and the seats. Support staff keeps it going. All negotiations support conditions that sustain successful teaching and student learning. That is the main thing. Most importantly, we won't let each other fail. Um, so then you have the partnership guiding principles and behavior. So this is how we behave with each other. Uh, you can read all those. I love sugarcoat difficult. You don't sugarcoat difficult issues, but I'm gonna talk about the first one. It's we work hard to understand the core of each other's job. If you understand what the person on the other side is talking, you know what what they have to go through. What political pressures are they reacting to? What are the things that they're listening to? Um, I have a, a better idea of of the superintendent's job by meeting with her on a regular basis and seeing what she has to react to. She also learns what pressures I have as a union president and the things I have to react to. And we keep those in mind as we're having discussions about where we're going to take the district. What's politically something that we can both survive? You know, you saw uh, let's let's not let each other fail. Sometimes those are difficult. You know. And negotiations, you, we don't, you don't swing over here and stomp somebody, and she doesn't swing over here and stomp you. you know, we meet kind of in the middle. So the victories are a little smaller, but we're both winners of those. You know? So uh, understanding the core of someone's job is so important. I was meeting with my rep counsel yesterday. Um, these are site reps. And there was a, there's a disconnect between secondary teachers and elementary teachers. They really don't understand each other's jobs. <laughs> Right? So when one person said, well, combo classes at the elementary, you know, the foreign language person at the high school said, well, I've got ninth through 10th graders and, you know, <laughs> completely different situation. So those are fundamental conversations that can happen at any level of, of your organizations. And so understanding someone's job allows you to make better decisions so that people don't get hurt along the way. Uh, continu continuing on the, the theme of the behaviors, um, one of the ones that's very important to all of us is that um, both sides own the contract. From the very beginning of each contract negotiations, the sides sit down together at the same table. All the sides are there together. There is no hidden agendas. There's no funny numbers that no one knows about. They're all together. They work together to develop a contract that everybody can be proud of, live with, and be a commitment to that contract. You know, almost every contract that we come to the school board, the vote is in the high 90% of approval. So they do their work ahead of time, and it, it makes for a um, very committed teaching staff, administrative staff, the uh, maintenance staff. Everybody is involved in the contract. They own it. They are part of the contract. It's their contract, it's not Ray's contract, it's not Dr. Sue's contract, it's not Rebecca's contract, it's everybody's contracts. And that's a very important part of, of what we do. And the next one is um, we laugh at ourselves and with each other, and, and you can imagine having already heard from Ray, uh, we do a lot of laughing at each other, not only <laughs> with each other, I guess, not only uh, among the contract negotiations with the various parties involved, we do do a lot of laughing at the school board meetings too. You know, it's serious business, but we still, we still do some. Uh, I've been known to tell a few jokes and, and get myself sort of in trouble sometimes, but it's all part of it. We're, we're all human, we're all in there for the kids, and that's the most important thing that we do, is for the kids. Uh, the next thing is a little hard to see, but this is a, um, an agreement that we reached in, uh, what was it, 2009? And it, it brought all the groups together between the teachers union, the administration, and of course, we approved this agreement. And it, it fosters the openness of what we do. It lays out what our philosophies are, what our behaviors are, and it's the mission statement of what our district does. And it's a, it's a working document, and it's the first of the kind, as far as I know, that it was ever done by any school districts. 
and we all signed it and we live by it. Every day we live by this contract, the mission statements, the philosophies, and the behaviors are all part of what we do in the district. And it's not just them, it's me too, it's the board. We believe in this also. The board buys into this, has bought into it, and are part of it from the very beginning. And, and we feel that we, although it says they own the contract, we feel like we own the contract too. It's, it's all part of us. I'm sure all of us have flow charts of our district where we're working at, and this is ours. We try to keep it very simple. Certainly, as I mentioned this in regards to our labor management collaboration, as uh, President Law said, the Board of Education is deeply involved. Uh, each of these divisions from the superintendent's office, business services, academic services, human resources, and school services, which is how we break out our divisions, each of these areas, when we had this collaborative process, there is someone from ABCFT who are working very closely with each of these divisions. In other words, in academic services right now, we've had uh, for the last several years since the implementation of the Common Core, we've had um, a person uh, who works very closely with our assistant superintendent of academic services and troubleshoots all along the way areas, for example, that might be problematic. And so we've had 144 teachers who have been involved as teacher leaders, as unit writers, uh, reviewers, coaches, but that also requires a lot of organization, a lot of planning, and also helping to work with the school sites. And so we have a person who is connected with academic services who can help write joint bulletins to all the teachers so that it's a communication that's done by both academic services and the teachers union so we're all on the same page uh, the last couple of years we've had a, a, a partnership advance we start out the school year with the site union reps from every school all 30 school sites as well as the principals and academic services and district office staff working together to look at all of the changes, all of the professional learning that we're going to be offering so that everybody knows what the calendar is going to look like for the next school year and all of the changes that are coming about. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, new, well not now it's several years old, but when we started out with um, some of the issues related to special education, in academic services. We knew that we needed to have uh, union reps from special ed working with our special ed team in our academic services department. So we created a props committee, and prop stands for proactive problem solving, so that they can bring to the table things that might be emerging from the school sites, whether it's staffing ratios or issues related to uh, instruction and materials. And the group meets every month and tries to resolve the problems before they become possible grievances. So again, each of, this divi each of the divisions have people that are connected with the union as part of the process in terms of everything in everything that we do. We've had two grievances in four years. Um, here is standing, uh, partnership standing meetings. Now this could be two slides. It's, it's grown since we've put this so what you see on one side is administrators, and the other side would be uh, union, uh, union stewards, union elected officials that, that are meeting with people at the cabinet level uh, throughout the district office. So they're getting together in September or August, and they're calendaring dates for the whole year, and they meet regularly. So let me give you an example. So uh, academic services started out three or four years ago with just uh, two people talking to each other, one from the union, one from the administration, to start to talk about what that was gonna look like. You know, what, or we wanted to start something because there's never been any uh, really good communication between academic services and, and the teachers union. And what impacts teachers the most is all the changes in academic services right now, right? And technology falls under that. So we started with one and now we have four pairs that work together. And just to show you, what, so each one of those meetings generates minutes, notes. And so those minutes were, for the last couple of years, just going to the reps. And the reps would get the, 
that information. Well, principals started to say, it would be nice if we had the notes too. And so now principals get those notes. So now you have partners at the school site level that have up-to-date information about what's coming from the district office and they're able to make good decisions at their site level because they're well informed about what's coming. So um, that's the, the partnership, uh, the power in this and having standing meetings. I was asleep, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the most important facts of what we do, obviously, is the budget and how the budget is developed and what has happened. Um, back in the 1990s, early 90s, we had a very difficult time. As you heard, we went, the teachers went on strike and there was a lot of distrust among the various parties. Uh, the teachers felt that uh, the board was somehow holding money. We had two sets of books, and, and where is all that money? We want the money, what are you doing with it, and why can't we have it too? Um, so out of this, we developed this uh, collaboration, and part of the collaboration certainly is the budget process. Um, the development of our collaborative effort really focuses on student achievement, and student achievement is guided by how we spend our money, where do we put it, how do we put our money. So if you look at the next, oh, I guess it's up there already, um, the two sides, the union side and the administrative side and anybody else attends the budget workshops together. We all hear the same facts, we all hear the same numbers. There is no doubt of what those numbers are. We both compare those numbers, they compare the numbers, I don't, they compare the numbers. Uh, the chief business officer and the, and the chief negotiator from the union meet on a regular basis to review those numbers, compare the numbers, determine where is that what's going to happen, how are we going to do with this, what are we going to do with the money, how can we do this. And all the unions meet on a regular basis with the superintendent to discuss the budget, where we are in the budget, what's going to happen in the budget next year, two years from now, five years from now, where are we. It's a very collaborative effort to determine the best use of the money that we have. You know, we all have very limited amounts of money, and so this way everybody, as we've said before, buy into the contract, they buy into the budget process. And it makes everybody have a better understanding of where the money goes, where the money comes from, and how we can proceed to have the best possible education for our students. Okay, so what does bargaining look like in ABC? Um, it's a hybrid, okay, so I'd say before we go into negotiations, we, we've, there are no surprises. If, if I was going to change anything on the slide that says we won't let each other fail, I'd actually change that to there are no surprises. We're having lots of conversations before we get in there about what the reality is. Political reality, financial realities, what's going on in the classrooms that we need to make changes for. And uh, well, here's an interesting one. Rationale for proposals are clear and reasonable. So. That's kind of a standard practice that we've had now, that if you're gonna ask for something, you, you're you gonna give a rationale, you're gonna give data. You know, talk about Common Core. You know, we're gonna give data of, about what why we're doing and what we're asking for. And so, uh, again, it's about having those conversations, informal conversations, before you get in the door so that you can make progress at the table. Our negotiations are one, two days. It's amazing, but that's because we've done a lot of legwork beforehand. And that's with any project that you do with the district. You know, you always do the heavy lifting in the beginning so you don't have to p clean up the mess in the end. And it, it really pays off. And it's much, it's, it's great to go to your job if you're building something and you know it's gonna work right rather than cleaning up a mess. Okay. So building our administrative leadership capacity in terms of the structure and the system in ABC is also very important. As we all know, principles change, leadership change happens every year. And so for us, when we hire new principals, first of all, we always have union reps uh, as part of the hiring process for any administrator in the district. And that's also including all of our principals. After they're hired, my expectation is that we put them through a two-year program we call it COMPASS, Coaching Our Management, Peer Assistance uh, Support System. 
as part of the COMPASS program, we train them about our expectations with labor management collaboration and the expectations of the partnership. And so that's something that is very important not only on my end in terms of building capacity in terms of our structure and system, but it's also part of Ray's end in building capacity with all of the union site reps as well. And you see that, uh, so we, we have reps. Reps are a reflection of the principal usually, right? So if we train the reps on how to have good ground truth conversations, and you see that right there, having fierce conversations, there's a book that we, that's kind of like the backbone of what we do. It's not about, you know, cat fights, but it's about having ground truth and, and being able to have those conversations that you really need to have. You can't brush problems under the carpet, but ju they just get bigger, right? So. You need to have those. And so you have to deliberately train your organizations to have new ways, new tools on how they're going to operate with the people that they're going to engage with. And so you, you can't just give them a book and say, here you go. You have to spend the money and the time. Where do we spend our money, the majority of our money? It's in training. You know, We don't use lawyers because we're not fighting over uh, grievances and going to arbitrations you know, and having hearings. No, we invest that in sending people all over the country to go to um, conferences, even if it's a conference that's it's, it's okay, you know, it's a, you know, but it's getting them away so that they have a pause and they can talk about the things that are happening at their site. You know, so they, they build those relationships. So it's always about building capacity for your, for your organization. Ray and Mary, I wonder if we can t start taking questions in a minute or so. Sure. I'm, I'm going to move it real fast. Okay, PAL Retreat is uh, uh, every October we have, it's kind of the cornerstone of what we've done for the last 15 years. Uh, we get together and figure out what our focus is going to be. It might be attendance. It might be uh, restorative justice. And we walk principals, all the principals and all the site reps together through a yearly process reevaluating where we are and where we want to go. I do want to give an opportunity for Rebecca to just go over our follow-up to the PAL, which is Partnership with Administration and Labor. Rebecca and CSEA, as well as AFSCME, have been a part of the workshops for several years, and I want her to be able to tell what's happened since her involvement with our PAL. Yeah, Ray. <laughs> I get a turn, too. I guess I'm buying next lunch, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, well, um, this is basically our story. Um, ABCFT decides to invite us to their PAL retreat, which we'd been going to for a couple years. And um, one year we were there, and it was when Dr. Sue actually came into um, her position. And Dr. Sue, as many of you know, um, has a vision, a really, really big vision that, um, that encompasses all stakeholders. And so when she said, would you be interested in creating your own PAL? We were like, yes, yes, we'd love to. So um, we, we then started. We, we figured, why a partnership? A partnership would only improve communication, definitely build the, the positive relationships that we were looking for, create a change in the environment that we were living in, and help us to focus on a common goal which is our student achievement, of course. Um, what our partnership looks like is um, our planning begins. We have monthly meetings with our superintendent, which she is committed to. Um, we do everything within our power to make sure that we meet. Um, it can be something as simple as just, how's everything going within ABC with CSEA? Or we have some serious issues to discuss. Um, but we are committed to having those conversations. Ongoing meetings with my two partners in HR, which are Dr. Uh, Susan Hickson, uh, who is the director of HR, and uh, our deputy assistant, our assistant superintendent of HR, Carol Hansen, who is always, always willing to work with us. Um, together, we've decided that we uh, agree on a common goal, which was professional development for classified staff, which is truly important. Um, we then had to come up with a name. So because I love to borrow from Ray, we took PAL2. <laughs> um, with pride. We took that name with pride. Uh, we then, 
we <laughs> we then assembled um, our advisory committee, which um, in which is Dr. Susan Hickson, myself, my right hand, Philomena Macedo, who's our VP, the secretary, a secretary from each elementary, middle, and high school, and two representatives from the district office staff. Um, in order to get what we needed to do for our classified staff, we took surveys. So it was input from both classified and the administration for us to decide what we were gonna do. Um, so then our professional de development begins. Uh, June 2012, our first workshop with 175 employees, Hidden Keys to Personal Success, where uh, we decided to adopt the model uh, world-class customer service, uh, which is what we do. As support staff, we provide exceptional customer service. Um, the last three years, we've um, offered a full menu of professional development opportunities, which include customer service, building positive relationships, technology workshops, Common Core, and PBIS. Um, classified staff looks forward to these. We do these during company time. We want to make sure that our employees know that they are valued and that we, we, accept, we accept and we expect the most from them because we put into their, their uh, professionalism and into their customer service training. And I attend and I steal everything they do. <laughs> they borrow. <laughs> um, so in summary, so in summary, um, through this pro partnership, uh, what have we done? We've built mutual trust, which was not easy, coming from an adversarial position at ABC only because this is the way we'd known to do things. We'd never known anything different. We tried C Fire, it didn't work for us. Um, so then we tried, we had to figure out a different way to do things. We'd seen what it had done for ABCFT, and we wanted that. We said, we see how this, this type of uh, partnership really and truly does um, put all the stakeholders into a better place, puts all the stakeholders into a position where they're all truly valued. Um, we work together to resolve conflicts and employee issues. We develop better understanding at, at the negotiation table like Ray touched on earlier. Because of the partnership we have now, we know that whatever the, the management team says for the district is what they really need. They, in turn, understand what we need as well. So um, having that understanding puts a different spin when we come to the table. Everything is on the table. Um, in closing, for me, made, we've made a commitment to the overall success of our students, staff, and the community we serve. Um, because after all, that's, that's what we do. That's what we do professionally. We serve our communities. And we're there for the kids. Um, and just a line from our last workshop that we did is, how many of you saw the Lego movie? Because you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews. Well, everything is awesome when you're part of a team, right? So um, that's what we are. We are awesome because we're part of a team. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> I'm just going to um, wrap it around the four main things that we said is a part of our partnership. It's about our relationships, the communication, the time that we've put into it, and certainly moving towards a common vision together. Thank you so much for letting us share our story. Um, I just want to add something, and I, I have to ask you to, to hang on to your questions because we need to get San Juan up. And I would ask that you uh, find these people at the next session, which will take place <clears throat> not here, but outside at the bar, which uh, <laughs> don't leave right now. Just hang on. <laughs> um, but I want to just say one more thing. Uh, uh, with any educational intervention, people always raise the question, does it really have an impact on student learning? And uh, the answer is yes. Um, it's hard to imagine why it wouldn't, uh, people working together in the way you've just heard. But we have a researcher here from the East Coast, Saul Rubenstein, who's over there, 
Saul uh, has spent a number of years with his colleagues studying the impact of this work in ABC Unified and has found that it indeed does have a very strong correlation with student outcomes. And he's going to uh, say a few words about that tonight at dinner, and then he has one of the breakout sessions he'll be leading. So if you want to find out what difference this makes uh, for children, Saul will be uh, uh, around a bit tonight and, uh, uh, and then tomorrow doing a breakout. So with that, um, uh, let's give a big round of applause to ABC and to San Juan to come up. <laughs>